filled her through this land of ours and filled a sportsman's dreams. Enjoy what nature holds for us, her bounty never ends. Getting back to basics with the practical sportsman. It's always an adventure, no matter where we go. From a favorite hunting spot to the hottest fishing hole. Outdoor life we all can share with family and friends. We'll do it all together with a practical sportsman. And we'll do it all together with a practical sportsman. Hi there, come on in. I'm Fred Trost, you're watching The Practical Sportsman. It is Thursday night, October 5th, the year 2000. This is one of these unfortunate shows. I call it unfortunate, some people like it, but I'm pretty much sick of the politics and the divisiveness and the arguing and bickering outdoors, but I have to apprise you of a couple things that are going on recently that you just need to know. Then we're gonna move on and get serious about having fun with our hunting and fishing. We're gonna talk about some hunting techniques the old-fashioned way with scrapes and rubs because baiting is on the rocks right now. Uh, but we're gonna get onto that the second part of the show. Please, stay tuned. Remember the hunter that sees scrapes all of a sudden mm -hmm. open up in his area? He needs to plan a marathon in that tree Fred Trost Practical Sportsman is brought to you in part by Marbles of Gladstone, Michigan, a maker of high-quality handcrafted sporting knives and sporting specialties that stand the test of time since 1898. Construction workers in Michigan are in high demand. The Michigan Regional Council of Carpenters knows that carpenters and millwrights have many opportunities. Our 18,000-plus members stand for quality in work and in life. The Carpenters and Joiners Union, building with pride and quality for over a century by Hawk Hollow Golf Course Banquet and Convention Center, featuring a clubhouse which accommodates 700. The 27-hole golf course winds through 500 acres of woods, hills, and lakes in Bath Township. Hawk Hollow, a beautiful place for a drive. And by the financial support of viewers like you. Before we get going with the real fun side of this show, I have several issues I must touch on. They're hot topics among sportsmen right now, and when I talk about hot, I mean very heated. One of them is this youth hunt that took place a couple weeks ago. This was something that apparently, through good sources, came from the governor's office. A political move to do something for the kids in this political year. Well, Sally Farhad, a free press staff writer, wrote uh, back earlier in the summer, she said, come September, Michigan young teens will have their own weekend to bag a deer without worrying whether a grown-up will shoot it first. Many people wondered, are the grown-ups that are with these kids going to be able to keep their fingers off the gun? Well, we've got some information on that. Uh, why did this come about, this youth hunt? Well, Sally Farhat says uh, the DNR had an ulterior motive. Faced with declining numbers of young hunters, Michigan's game managers wanted to attract more young people to the sport. Aha, was that the real reason? If it was, how is a youth hunt, 14 to 16-year-olds in September, going to accomplish that? Is it really going to work? Well, Sally Farhat said, the special hunt has its detractors, though, and those detractors are coming out in large numbers now that this hunt is over. Well, I can't see where they got any privileges any more than anybody else. The kids that they allowed to hunt during this season were already legal to hunt anyway during the regular firearm deer season. Also, if they're going to let these young kids hunt early, they should let the senior citizens hunt early. They're the ones that can't take the cold, have arthritis. They shouldn't be forced to hunt during the cold when they could have been hunting in September when the young kids were. Also, I feel that a good percentage of the deer that was shot during that season was shot by the um, guardian or father or whatever it was that was along with the kid. That's just my opinion. I'm sure that it happened. In an area where we have farmland, our family has farmland, I know of five bucks, 10 points or larger, that was taken during this season by supposedly a junior hunter. That bothers you? Yes, it does. Why, why? That's my question. 
Why? Where did they get the idea that this 14 to 16 year old kid had any more privileges than anybody else? He didn't request this hunt. They just dreamt it up somewhere. Well, Fred Bebo is not the only one to question the logic behind this youth hunt that the DNR has thrust upon people, thrust upon kids who didn't even ask for it. But what effect would this have in the newspapers, on the kids, and so on? I, I have to read to you a few excerpts from an article that was sent to me by Bob Gwids, the Booth Newspapers, he's an outdoor writer. Though the deer escaped, it was still a successful hunt. Let me read to you just some select sentences here and see what you think. Uh, Bob talks about his son. If, if you've had a teenage son before, you know exactly what we're talking about. He said, over the years, I've dragged him along with me a few times, but for the most part, he hasn't been all that interested. This year, however, the special weekend youth hunt provided a rare opportunity. I started talking it up in the summer. But it wasn't until the application for tickets for the Michigan State Notre Dame game came back unfilled that he finally committed. Once again, any of you who have had teenage boys uh, can believe that. Hunting, it isn't so much that they're against hunting. Just doing things with dad is uh, you know, kind of not their highest priority. Well, anyway, the season came up. Bob Gwids and his son were in the woods, and here's his account of what happened on the opening morning. A doe stuck her head from the pines on the side of the shooting lane, pulled back, then stepped into the opening. Within a second, a fawn was at her side. Then another. A third appeared slightly behind. I heard the rifle report next to me. My son had squeezed the trigger the precise moment the shot was there. Now, you got the picture? Doe, three fawns? Okay. I searched the ground. There was no hair, no blood. Had he missed her cleanly? Later on videotape, we saw that the shot appeared to hit a sapling in front of the deer. The doe with the three fawns. Okay, following morning, we were in a blind maybe 20 miles away. Right before 8 a.m., six deer came quartering towards us. My boy picked up the lead deer when she cleared a pine, in, pine tree in front of us. He touched off the trigger. The animal went down in a heap. I had him reload, and we walked toward the fallen deer. I had my knife out, ready to finish her, when inexplicably she got to her feet and bounded off maybe 60 yards. Now, remember this concern, talking about kids don't have to worry about their adults taking deer and so on. Well, the adults don't have licenses. Uh, according to the law, they're not supposed to finish off deer. This is supposed to be a youth hunt. Keep that in mind. Now listen to this. Bob Gwid says, I grabbed the rifle from my boy, no way he needs to be running with a firearm, and ran up to where I could see the deer. I called for my son to hurry. When he arrived, I flipped off the safety and handed him the rifle. The deer chose that moment to get up again and crash off into some tag alders. Okay. Father has gun, loaded gun, in woods with safety off, deer in front. Okay. I followed, finding blood in several places. Then I lost the trail. I spent an hour. It was no use. She was gone. And that was the end of the two-day hunting account, basically. An hour tracking the deer. Didn't call anybody else in. He didn't say he and the boy tracked the deer. I tracked the deer. I spent an hour. Is that what this youth hunt was supposed to be about? Well, how do you evaluate the success of this? Bob Gwids closes his article saying about his son, he said that maybe he would go to camp with his uncles and grandpa this year. Maybe it was a successful hunt after all. What do you think? If you take a kid hunting in September, get a doe with three fawns in front of him, and then track a deer down and don't get it, and the kid says, maybe I'll hunt with grandpa and the uncles, that's Teenage kids just love to be with, you know, people over 30 or 40 or 50. I don't know. I, I do know one thing. We should not blame the kids. Uh, people have contacted me about some youngsters who have gotten some really nice deer during the season. We don't want to take anything away from them. Any mistakes that have happened or anything else, it's not the kids' fault. This whole thing was engineered by adults 
and engineered by politicians, for that matter. Uh, I'm not going to have a special big buck night for the early season and give any special credit. These kids now can wait in line with everybody else for big buck night and the awards banquets and so on. But that's fine. Uh, remember, the DNR said, faced with a declining number of young hunters, Michigan's game managers want to attract more young people to the sport. And of course, we want to know what did this September youth hunt really accomplish. I am doing right now a Freedom of Information Act request to the DNR, asking documents for documents relating to these subjects, anything that explains the objectives and or rationale for the September uh, 2000 youth deer hunt. I would like to have any scientific papers or other documentation that the DNR Commission relied on as a basis that an early youth hunt will accomplish the DNR's objective. Plus, I'd like to know any documents that touch on the DNR's plan for evaluating the success of the youth hunt. Now, I also put in here that I realize the evaluation hasn't taken place yet. I'm just looking for the methodology the DNR will use to scientifically evaluate the impact of the youth hunt on the deer the impact on the youth who did and who did not participate, and if relevant, the impact on any other social science or political science goals that the DNR may have been using the youth hunt to accomplish. How, we got to find that out. Are they going to evaluate this thing or is it just a political ploy? Oh, one more thing I'm asking for. Any documents to or from the governor's office relating to the youth hunt? And when I get this information, I will certainly pass it on to you. I'm really not happy that I'm the one who has to dig out this information and bring it to you. I put this on this program because I can't find this information anywhere else. That's why I go to the Freedom of Information Act. The DNR is not forthcoming with information about the hunt. Now, Bob Gwid said in his article, though the deer escaped, it was still a successful hunt. Well, Bob is talking about his own hunt with his own kid, and you can determine from what you read on this, was it successful? Can you say that a deer escaped if it was wounded and he only looked for it for an hour? We don't know about the other deer. So that in a microcosm, was that hunt a success? And in, in the macrocosm, was this overall youth hunt a success? Where are you going to find that information? Uh, check the newspapers. This is really disappointing. A week after the hunt, uh, you look in the Lansing State Journal, look at the outdoor page. I mean, this used to be a whole page of material. We have a half a page. Bow season finally begins. Avoid moose in UP. Uh, that's all. Heck, you flip over to the other page, bowling has much more space than the outdoors does. That's the Lansing State Journal. No information on the issues. Go to the Detroit News. Used to have a full page. Would hit all the issues. Uh, check it out here on 7D. And we got hockey and, okay, little column here on the side. Dave Ritchie wrote, accidents can occur in stand, talking about tree stand safety. That's it. Where are you going to get information on these issues? Unfortunately, I feel like I'm just about the only one laying it out. Next week, I will lay out the baiting issue, how that's divided hunters 50-50. It's tearing the hunting community apart, economically, uh, socially. <laughs> these things... I'm sorry you can't get information in these other publications, but that's the way it is. So I'll bring that to you next week. Now, right now, reorient your thoughts. Let's get in a fun mode, the fun of hunting deer. Uh, I'm going to go back to a tape that I did in 1990 with a couple of experts on deer behavior. I think if we focus on that, we can get our mind off of these political issues. And let's see if you can't learn something about scrapes and rubs that adds to your enjoyment of deer hunting. Bucks leave two special signs in the woods that excite hunters, rubs and scrapes. The most common is rubs. For years it was thought that bucks only rubbed to peel off the velvet from the new antlers, but recent studies indicate that rubs are communication points, that when bucks rub, they're actually wiping secretions from their forehead glands onto the trees. Now this explains why bucks make rubs long after their velvet has peeled away. Bob McGuire, deer researcher and adjunct professor of biology at East Tennessee State University, told me about these new findings. The bucks are depositing probably a they're probably depositing a significant pheromone on a rub, and that is probably instrumental in the timing of estrus locally. 
that, that is the does apparently do respond and they will apparently come into estrus somewhat sooner in areas that have rubs appearing somewhat sooner. Hmm. And this is, so this is new stuff and it's, mm -hmm. it's accurate. If rubs tend to bring does into estrus early, what about making mock rubs on trees? You know, making the does think that bucks are rubbing in the area? Would a mock rub work? But foamy rubs won't do it because you've got to have the pheromone. You've got to have the pheromone on there. There are other, uh, other uh, purposes for rubs. Uh, a biologist uh, out of Guelph, Ontario, Bubinek, has suggested that the deer might uh, rub partly to uh, become aware of the extremities of his growth. It's like a, uh, a person with a f with fresh mustache goes like this. A person who gets in a car with a hat on for the first time and he knocks against something, they go tick, 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 and it'll get the def uh, he'll define the extremities. They don't know what's out there. They can't see it, and they're touching stuff. It's so sort of it's like the backs of our heads. Sure. Yours and mine. You can't see it. But we do because we videotape <laughs> it and look at it, and then we know what we look like back sure. there. The deer never get a chance to look at themselves in the mirror. Right. Rubs evidently have a lot more practical value in the deer world than we've thought. Knocking off that velvet just might be incidental. But a scrape is another sign that hunters like to hunt near. A scrape is made by a buck pawing a bear patch in the soil. A scrape looks like a tracking pit, a bear area on a trail that researchers rake clean to see if deer are using the trail. Now there's been a lot of theories about scrapes, when they're made, why, how often bucks come back to check them. But most of these theories, I think, have been wrong. At Cades Cove in the Smoky Mountains, we've done a lot of, of setups. In fact, the, the mock scraping that I used to, uh, whereby I would put out pod or I'd bear the earth uh, at, in locations beneath logical scrape uh, marking branches, uh, a lot of times I thought I was promoting an early rut. I was not so clever as I thought. <laughs> I would only open up a tracking pit. My mock scrapes early on were, were basically uh, based on my ability to recognize good scraping locations and hence identify potential licking sites where the deer are already coming in. Now you said licking site, you're licking branches. Licking branch, right. Yeah, that's a summertime chemical communication. That, summertime? Yeah, it's principally in the summer. Uh, I thought that branches. was just in the fall with the... No, in fact, there's a misnomer, a lot of hunters. Bob McGuire discovered that the mock scrape technique he thought would induce bucks to come back or increase their scraping behavior or even cause does to come into heat sooner was focusing on the wrong spot. The ground is not where the important communication was taking place. John Ozaga, deer researcher for the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, found that scrapes could be induced by bending a branch over a deer trail in the right location. First of all, it's got to be in an area of a lot of deer activity, preferably a trail. It's got to have sparse undercover. You can't have a lot of sod or a lot of brush. It's got to be the typical leaf litter type stuff. The soil's got to be easily bared. It should be level, not rocky, not wet. Just, you know, whatever the typical scrape site is. And you can see these when you're out there. You, you can detect them. But a lot of times, the, the missing factor is the overhead limb, the scent, the scent marking limb. And you can actually put what I would describe as a kind of a bent fishpole type limb in the right configuration so that it will hang, the tip of it will hang about head high on a buck. And I can, in my, my studies, I can get 80% of them to turn into uh, buck scrapes. It's put in the right, and I don't know scenting or anything. I don't even have to do anything with the, the area beneath it. While John Ozaga found that he could artificially induce scraping behavior by placing a licking branch artificially on a tree, Bob McGuire found out that these licking branches are used at other times of the year, too. Uh, there are a lot of behaviors that are done year-round that are only significant seasonally, or at a certain time in the cycle, perhaps the rut or estrus cycle of the animal. Uh, for instance, during the, the summertime chemical marking, they go through all of the behavior components of scraping except the actual scraping of the ground. They rub their forehead that is not glandular, is a gland, has no glandular activity during the summer. They do all the licking, the nuzzling, the marking behavior, but that behavioral component is senseless at that time. During the summer, the forehead glands of that perhaps dominant buck are inactive, yet he continues to apparently forehead mark. It's probably the saliva that is the important uh, source uh, or is a source of an important summertime chemical, whereas it's a forehead for certain 
Uh, this is, this is well fall. understood now in the fall, that during a rut. When I give shows in Pennsylvania, I have to address bow hunters often who are upset that the gun season comes in right at the advent of the peak of a rut, that little tight time period during which most of the breeding takes place locally. And the, the local bow hunters are upset that they cannot hunt the rut. And I say, have you tried hunting your scrapes before they appear? And when I go back in subsequent years and talk to those same audiences, I'm surprised at how many of them have gone back and searched out those scrapes and found the scrape hunting better, if you call it that, before the scrapes appear. So in other words, the bucks are coming in and they are using the licking branch and visiting that location, yeah. but they are not scraping on the ground yet. Correct. You know, it's common for bow hunters in particular to set up a tree stand near a fresh scrape. <laughs> in the next couple days, they don't even see a deer coming by there. The reason is, Bob McGuire says, that scrapes are actually very short-term behaviors. Remember the hunter that sees scrapes all of a sudden mm -hmm. open up in his area? He needs to plan a marathon in that tree or to set up on the fringe of the area and call with, with uh, doe vocalizations or grunts. That is a, a cue to the hunter that, that a buck likely has, has encountered uh, a pre-estrous doe sign in that, in that area. If a buck you know, comes into an area and, and all of a sudden hangs in that area, and I'm trying to not say solicits does by scrapes, so that's a common conception. If he starts pounding the ground with scrapes and maybe tearing up brush, a hunter needs to focus on that, but only for a short time. Because that, that buck is shopping and he's, he's, he's shopping. Close. When he hooks up with that doe, they're history. Mm -hmm. Well, that explains why a scrape can be hot and active on one day and seemingly abandoned for the next couple of days. You know, scrapes and rubs are the subject of a lot of mythology among deer hunters. Let's go back and review the conclusions that we've learned from recent deer research. Rubbing is how bucks deposit forehead scents on trees and branches. A preponderance of buck forehead scent in an area evidently causes does to come into heat sooner. Bucks sometimes rub and thrash branches just to see how big their antlers are and what they can do. Licking branches are used by bucks all summer long, where they go through all the elements of scraping behavior except pawing the ground. Heavy scraping is done by a buck when he senses that a doe in the area is in heat or coming into heat. After finding the doe, the scrapes and licking branches are abandoned, at least temporarily. Scrapes and rubs are the most exciting buck sign a deer hunter can find, but too often an active scrape is old news. Arriving at a spot an hour ahead of when a buck will show up to make a rub or a scrape or check a licking branch, that's the real challenge to a trophy buck hunter. <laughs> Hunting scrapes when you know a big one might pop out at any minute is exciting. That's one thing that turns on hunters and turned on one who got in our trophy book. Kevin Rollette from Lakeland, Hunter Washtenaw County, and he got a, a nine point buck. It's all kinds of tines here, real close, almost like a symmetrical rack, a globe, or a yep. basketball or something. Yep, there's one broke right here. Um, when I shot him, I thought he was a 10 point. He was probably about three feet from my tree when I shot him. I missed him opening day, and here's where the adrenaline part comes in, the excitement part of hunting. And all week, that's, I was like right there, right there, right there. Then all of a sudden I turn around and here he starts coming through the brush, started grunting, and I'm sitting here letting him come closer and closer. And he got about three feet from the tree and I had to aim straight down, and I dropped him right there. Any, any reason that you didn't shoot sooner, like, 10 feet, that's not a bad shot. I was kind of seeing how close he could get, because I bow hunt, and I always like to see how close I can let the deer get. You know, not like the guy with the bear that was nubbing him. Yeah. You know, but, wow. yeah, this way when I climbed out of the tree, I didn't have to go far to get him. So that for you is a rush of hunting, to how close the animal could Oh, yeah, go? oh, yeah. I mean, that's just your heart rate goes up, your adrenaline's pumped, and you want to go tomorrow, but you can't because you have no more licenses. That shouldn't have been a problem this year. No, I, I ain't going to go there with the DNR. Okay. We don't have that much time. Yeah, well, this is, this is great. Kevin Roulette from Lakeland, the buck that came to the close encounter. Thanks, Congratulations. Sir. Now, remember, if you get a big buck 
and you want a chance to be on Big Buck Night or come to one of our banquets and be interviewed for the trophy book or just get the Marbles Hunting Award, you need a buck that has one of three things, either 10 antler points or an outside spread of 18 inches or one tine that is at least 10 inches long. Now that could be a spike buck. Now, another thing, let's see, I ought to squeeze a recipe in here. Here's the quickest recipe I've ever done. You like pickled eggs at deer camp. What I do is I take olive juice or pickle juice. After I eat the cloths and pickles, I like all those spices in it. Just drop the hard boiled eggs in there and you have the recipe. This Saturday at the museum, the last puppy Saturday of the year, I'm gonna be here. Our taxidermists won't be Don Gadilly and Tim Hayes. They are going to be duck hunting. It is the duck opener. I'm going to go duck hunting on Sunday. Next week, I'll bring you duck hunting. I hope you get outdoors, put a smile on your face, and have fun. It's a great place to be. See you next week. Fred Trost Practical Sportsman is brought to you in part by Marbles of Gladstone, Michigan, a maker of high-quality handcrafted sporting knives and sporting specialties that stand the test of time since 1898. Construction workers in Michigan are in high demand. The Michigan Regional Council of Carpenters knows that carpenters and millwrights have many opportunities. Our 18,000 plus members stand for quality in work and in life. The Carpenters and Joiners Union, building with pride and quality for over a century. By Hawk Hollow Golf Course Banquet and Convention Center, featuring a clubhouse which accommodates 700. The 27-hole golf course winds through 500 acres of woods, hills, and lakes in Bath Township. Hawk Hollow, a beautiful place for a drive. And by the financial support of viewers like you. He needs to plan a marathon in that tree or to set up on the fringe of the area and call with, with uh, doe vocalizations or grunts. That is a, a cue to the hunter that, that a buck likely has, has encountered uh, a pre-estrous doe sign. In that, in that area. If a buck you know, comes into an area and, and all of a sudden hangs in that area, and I'm trying to not say solicits does by mm -hmm. scrapes, so that's a common conception. If he starts pounding the ground with scrapes and maybe tearing up brush, a hunter needs to focus on that, but only for a short time. Because that, that buck is shopping and he's, he's, he's shopping. Close. When he hooks up with that doe, they're history. Mm -hmm.